be recording this um, so that folks who aren't able to join um, can listen in or that you can refer back to this if you need to. So without further ado, um, let me kick it over to Ashley Carter. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Carter, director of the Michigan Justice Fund. Um, we're a philanthropic initiative designed to address issues of mass incarceration across the state. We're a collaborative of 14 funders, both local and national, um, who are working on these issues. Our three primary focuses are um, supporting the economic mobility of directly impacted people, reducing the state's reliance on incarceration and supporting movement um, across the state. So we're really excited to be um, developing this grant program because one of the things we really wanna see is public-private partnerships and shifting of public spending towards these issues and also um, the creation and support of innovative approaches to re-entry and workforce development. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much for your work. And I'll drop the link to our website um, in the chat for people who are interested in learning more. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we are going to move over to talk about the grant while you're all here today. Uh, so the goals and objectives of this RFP um, is really to advance innovative and scalable strategies that support um, folks who are formerly incarcerated access workforce. Um, you know, one large part of this is really um, lifting up um, and supporting programs that are developed with input from adults who are currently or formerly incarcerated, so centering their perspective and voice. Uh, we also, you know, hope that these RFPs really possess the potential for advancing systems change. Um, as Ashley mentioned, you know, the some of the goals of the Michigan Justice Fund um, is really to shift public spending. Um, and we believe that with strong programs that have evidence behind them, um, there's the opportunity um, to make a case for doing that. Um, but we recognize that there does need to be large systems change in order to effectively serve all those in Michigan who've been incarcerated. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, right, and, and the the big thing that this, this RFP is really uh, hoping to support is increasing opportunities for formerly incarcerated adults to achieve economic mobility. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to a colleague of mine to go into more details um, about the grant. Hey everyone, I'm Alex Breen. I'm a senior policy associate at Corporation for a Skilled Workforce and have been uh, working throughout the last three months on the development of the RFP um, and thinking about the goals and objectives for what we want to achieve through this funding opportunity. Uh, so my role here is to get into the meat and potatoes, the nitty gritty, um, and talk about the details of this year's funding opportunity. Uh, I think it's important to note that the fund anticipates that up to $2.2 million will be awarded to support organizations in implementing workforce development and reentry initiatives uh, to improve opportunities for the economic mobility of formerly incarcerated Michiganders. Worth noting that there are two very distinctive types of grants uh, that are going to be funded uh, through this grant cycle. Uh, the first is for implementation grants, um, and that is grants to direct service providers that are actively doing the work uh, and those are uh, implementation grants can fall into one of three categories, and we'll detail that later on. Uh, but it's worth noting that up to six hundred thousand uh, dollars will be awarded to individual grantees, um, and that's for eighteen to twenty-four month project periods, uh, which should allow uh, ample time for implementation and demonstration of proof of concept. Uh, the secondary category uh, is of equal importance here, um, and this is where a lot of the uh, innovation will originate from, and that's planning grants of up to $100,000 for up to a 12-month planning process. Uh, and those are for projects that have not already been realized, uh, but are being conceptualized, um, and there will be a part two to those funding that will actually make implementation funds available. Uh, Chioki, can you bring me to the next slide, please? So worth noting that um, the uh, the the grant window is actively open um, and worth noting that uh, Flux, uh, the system is being used, uh, has some eccentricities to it. 
um, and definitely uh, we would highly recommend uh, that everyone, uh, if they are planning or even considering putting forth the grants, uh, that they go through the process uh, today or tomorrow of registering for Flux. Uh, the deadline for registrations is November 1st um, and would hate for uh, somebody to miss out because of a, a portal issue. Uh, and that is something that has been reported previously. Uh, would note that uh, we're hoping today uh, to answer any and all questions that will allow for uh, the submission of uh, a robust and diverse array of proposals. And the uh, November 11th is the deadline for application submissions. Um, we're going to uh, allow ourselves and the MJF team about 40 days to review uh, and plan right now on getting uh, funding announcements uh, out on uh, December 22nd, 2022. I believe that's the Friday, that's the Thursday before the Christmas break. Um, and then the turnaround time in terms of grant disbursement is going to be super prompt. Uh, announcements on the 22nd, funds distributed January 1st, 2023. Shioki, can you move me forward, please? Great. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, for implementation grants, uh, implementation grants can fall into one of three categories. Uh, and category one uh, is the advancement of new or emerging strategies uh, that may lack evidence. Uh, but possess promise for impact. Uh, that could be uh, looking at uh, another locality that has successfully implemented a, a re-entry grant, um, but you know perhaps there isn't a, a great track record of local application in Michigan or in the area where you're hoping to implement. Uh, grants like that can fall into that category. Uh, category two, uh, would be the addressing of persistent gaps or challenges uh, in an existing program serving formerly incarcerated Michigan adults uh, would uplift that uh, in advance of uh, our grant making cycle. We conducted interviews with direct service providers and with uh, justice involved Michiganders uh, who reported a myriad of challenges that have undermined their ability to become more economically mobile. I would point folks to the application to the what we know section to see some elements of what we heard, um, but note that uh, certainly that there's some persistent gaps that exist within existing programs that if uh, if remedied or if those barriers were overcome uh, would allow more of the participants in those programs to achieve economic mobility. Um, and that would be uh, the types of applications that we're envisioning for category two. Uh, and then the third one is for the scaling and deploying of existing strategies uh, that have been proven to be successful in Michigan and are ripe for local, regional, or statewide application. If you're already running a program, uh, the, uh, the way that the program operates has been uh, institutionalized. And the only thing that's really needed is additional funds to bring a strategy to scale or to bring a strategy to a different place. Uh, that is applications that would fall into that category. As mentioned, uh, mentioned previously, uh, grants uh, in this category are up to $600,000, and we're looking at an 18 to 24 month grant window. Uh, we're strongly encouraging MOUs or letters of commitment uh, from any partners or advisory groups. Uh, that could be if there are uh, supportive service partners that are providing mental health counseling services, uh, demonstration of those partnerships being in place would certainly help the case of applicants here. Uh, as would the case of if you're proposing an industry-specific uh, employment training, uh, being able to demonstrate buy-in from industry partners, including employers, industry trade associations, uh, that would be examples of the type of MOUs that we're looking for there. I uh, want to strongly uh, note that, uh, I apologize if I'm saying strongly too much, uh, that any type of uh, organization is eligible to apply here. Um, including organizations that do not currently provide workforce services. Um, one of the reasons that that's the case is through our conversations with justice-involved Michiganders, we heard time and time again that people are uh, people become exhausted navigating between 15 different entities to access services um, and received a lot of recommendations from service providers uh, and from justice-involved Michiganders that if services could be consolidated that that would ease access. So you certainly don't need to be operating a workforce program right now to apply for this funding opportunity. Uh, and then lastly, uh, partnerships where relevant are encouraged um, and recognize that uh, oftentimes content expertise is spread between multiple organizations. 
um, and through partnerships, some of the greatest solutions to complex issues can be found. Uh, Chioki, can you take me to the next slide, please? And then want to lastly just detail uh, the planning grant. Um, and that is to note that uh, for the planning grant, we're really looking for uh, partnerships uh, or advance. We're looking to advance partnerships between community-based organizations and publicly funded entities. Um, and here funds will be used to conduct research, brainstorm, gather stakeholder feedback. Also to provide space for partners to develop deep collaboration and necessary tools and to develop program design and implementation plans uh, and a logic model framework. Um, and note that uh, CSW is uh, going to be providing pretty robust technical assistance, especially around some parts of the strategy, like the construction of a logic model framework. Um, and that is uh, because we obviously want these strategies to demonstrate proof of concept, be scalable, um, and be replicable so that systems change can be achieved. Uh, things to know about planning grants uh, is grants of up to $100,000 uh, will be awarded, and that's for, 12, that's for the 12-month uh, planning process. Again, MOUs or letters of commitment are required here, uh, outlining individual roles and responsibilities. Uh, we really want to center uh, the compensated, uh, we really want to center the expertise of currently and formerly incarcerated Michiganders. Um, and are hoping that uh, they will not only be compensated for their time, um, but that the process of designing, implementing, and evaluating these new strategies uh, will be driven and center the experiences of the currently or formerly incarcerated. Um, and lastly, again, grantees will receive technical assistance during and throughout the planning period. Shioki, can you bring me forward to the next slide? And now, lastly, really, uh, the support and expectations of, uh, want to just detail the supports uh, and expectations of grantees. Um, and we're, we're really looking for an active community uh, in which the sharing and uplifting of best practices uh, will be consistent and will be really uh, regular. Um, so we're looking for uh, grantees uh, that are excited about participation uh, in cohort-driven technical assistance and information sharing looking for uh, regular reporting uh, of program milestones and outcomes to the Michigan Justice Fund team, uh, to the co-creation uh, of a logic model framework with support from CSW, uh, to actively sharing key findings, barriers and policy change suggestions via blog posts, webinars, and social media. Uh, and again, that's because systems change is certainly the name of the game here and then to uh, identification of cross-grantee collaboration opportunities. And lastly, to actively working towards, a create, towards creating uh, a sustainable funding model with the support of technical assistance. And just on, the, on a note for that last one, you know, we wanna make sure that um, the great programs that are either um, given additional investment or um, the programs that are um, created throughout the, the planning um, grant period um, don't end when the grant ends. And so that's a, a really large part about that um, is making sure that there's long-term sustainable funding um, so that the great work that all of you are doing um, can be continued uh, beyond the life cycle of, of that grant. So I think I'm up next, um, but I, I realized that um, in an effort to get as close to you asking the questions, I failed to introduce another um, key person um, that's been supporting the development of this RFP and really drove um, all the writing behind the What We Know section of the RFP, and that is our Michigan Justice Fund fellow, Jerry Ackerman, who's on the line. He's a current master's student um, at Eastern Michigan University the School of Social Work, but um, I just wanted to lift him up and the great work that he's been doing um, and continues to, to do. Because uh, even though the fellowship ended, we're figuring out a way to, to, to keep him on board. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me go to the FAQ section. Perfect. So um, some of these um, were actually asked um, during the registration process. So I want to make sure I address that. Um, but also wanted to kind of highlight big bucket questions that um, oftentimes you receive. So who's eligible? Any Michigan-based organization. And again, 
um, lifting up. These are funds available not just to traditional workforce organizations, um, but they are available to organizations who are um, kind of doing uh, supporting um, reentry work. Uh, educational institutions are eligible, um, like community colleges, um, other nonprofits. And um, while we are are hoping for uh, the shifting of public funds back into the community, um, publicly funded entities are eligible as well. So what are the expected program outcomes? So often um, for those on the workforce side, um, there's typically some sort of key um, employment or job placement goals, uh, credential attainment goals, um, and wage goals. And um, what we wanna lift up is that MJF doesn't have any expected program outcome other than that this work supports the economic mobility of those who are formerly incarcerated. And while we expect organizations who get these funds to track things like job placement, we recognize that um, each organization and program is different. And so we'll be working with those grantees to make sure that important milestones, participant milestones um, are tracked. So maybe it could be um, attainment of long-term housing. Uh, it could be um, for some organizations, they recognize that um, obtaining uh, uh, CAR is something that actually supports their program participants to um, advance economically. And for some, it might be um, seeking out and obtaining mental health services. Um, so again, there's no specific program outcomes um, expected for um, those that apply to this. Would, so what would do we- you, would, yep. would you supplement that answer by saying that in thinking about the roles of formerly incarcerated Michiganders, this is one area in terms of evaluation and thinking about metrics that reflect uh, what it, what demonstrates success for formerly incarcerated Michiganders? Uh, there might be a, that might be a great opportunity. There's where there's room for integration of formerly incarcerated Michiganders in the evaluation process and in the construction of a logical logic model framework. So, what do we want to see in the application? So, clear, concise uh, answers. <laughs> um, but I think most importantly, we want to make sure that. Um, what we're reading um, really uh, demonstrates that uh, those who are either crafting the program, crafting the grant, have actually um, incorporated the perspectives of those who are formerly incarcerated and centered that. Uh, can these grants support programs serving re-entering youth? Uh, great question. So these um, grants are specifically focused on adult serving um, organizations. Um, but note that MJF does anticipate funds being available specifically to, to support youth in 2023, which is just in a few months. Um, is this the only opportunity to apply for funds? No. So again, MJF will continue to have funds available next year, and they also have um, two other opportunities. So you can submit an LOI or a letter of um, inquiry on the MJF website that Ashley um, placed in the chat. And there's also um, rapid response grant. So if an organization um, has a critical need right now for a little bit of funds, um, you can apply to those as well. And do you want to add anything else, else on that, Ashley? No. Okay. Can these grants support expungement clinics? So um, if there's an organization that recognizes that um, criminal record expungement is the missing gap, right, in the program um, that they're offering that makes it difficult for their participants to um, enter the workforce and achieve economic mobility, um, then we could see an opportunity for folks to apply um, for the implementation grant in that, that gap or barrier. Um, but we do not, um, this specific grant is not intended to fund just an expungement clinic. Does it matter how much you ask for? Great question. So I know that there's always a strategy, right? Like if I go under and I have a low bid, then I'm more, um, I, you know, I might have a better opportunity to receive the grant, or if I go for the, the full amount, then maybe also I'll get more opportunity. All requests, whether it's $5,000 to fill a gap or $600,000 for an implementation will have equal um, consideration. So apply for what you need, right? So don't, if you recognize that for your, um, and I'm coming from somebody who's applied to grants like this in the past, right? Um, you know, sometimes, right, we, we cut out the, the things that we know are really important, like participant stipends, as an example, because we think that we need to get under. If you feel like your program needs participant stipends, put that funding in, right? Um, so we wanted to, to call that out. 
And number eight, so Alex alluded to this and talked a little bit about it, but I don't want my planning grant to sit on the shelf. Will, will it? Uh, no. So in the new year, um, MJF also um, is planning to have some funds specifically to support the implementation of those that received a planning grant um, to advance that idea and stand up that. And we're also um, looking to find additional matching funds to even amplify that amount as well. So what do you mean by collaboration for the planning grant? Um, so when we mean collaboration, we mean that every organization has equal um, kind of skin in the game, right? And is leaning into their key expertise. Uh, and so, you know, when we ask for that um, kind of MOU for, um, partners, we really want to understand kind of what are the key roles and responsibilities, how will you hold yourselves accountable. Um, and I think, you know, collaboration for us is also trust, like we want to make sure organizations are stepping to the table and have that level of trust so that they really can um, fully support those that are returning. Uh, the second to last question, I've never applied to MJF, what should I know? Alex also talked about that, but you know, there is an electronic system. And as with any piece of technology, um, sometimes it can be tricky. And there are documents that you do have to upload um, that are specific to your organization. So we want to make sure that folks go in there um, and set up their, their grant or their, um, their profile and register. Every person who um, is at an organization uh, that needs to go into the flux system. This is the um, the grants management system should have their own registration. Uh, so if you have a finance person, but also a program person who's actually drafting the RFP responses, we would recommend having both of those folks have a registration. And last but not least, what are the planning grant funds supposed to go to? Yeah, like what am I supposed to use these hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, or up to a hundred thousand dollars for? And so we did outline that in the RFP and in what Alex talked about. Um, but we recognize that all of you doing this work, um, well, I would say, I would assume that the vast majority of the, you doing this work have a capacity, right, issue. Um, we always want to do more than we actually have time to do. And so we wanted to be able to give this space. Um, so if that means that your organization wants to shift some of the responsibilities of a key staff member so they can focus on, on um, kind of supporting the planning grant process, and backfilling with another person, then do that. If you feel like you want to have um, somebody do some community research um, and you need to compensate them for that, then you can do that. But really this is to give um, the partners in the in the space the capacity uh, to, to actually do the work that you need to develop a robust program, um, as well as having funds to compensate those um, whose expertise you are seeking. So, with that, we are going to move into your specific questions. Uh, and so if you could, um, I'm actually gonna unshare my screen, uh, but if you guys could write your questions in the chat and we'll address them. If you'd rather verbally ask that, just raise your hand and we can call on you. Veronica? Yes, hi, Jokey. Um, I have three questions. Maybe I should put them in the chat. But my first is, are there any costs that are not allowable for, I guess, either implementation or planning? Want me to wait or want me to just go through my question? Ashley, do you want to address that? Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Are there any costs that are not allowable? <clears throat> I would say add whatever your costs are in and then um we can address that like you know if the grant were to be awarded can you share kind of what you have in mind because i will note that like one of the things we want to do is make sure that people are being compensated for their time and so like we have like um been talking about what does it look like to build in compensation for directly impacted people who are advising a strategy or something like that um, we cannot resource lobbying. So if that's like a piece of your work, we're a C3 organization, so we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, we don't do like campaign contributions, similarly, because we're a C3. Um, I'm trying to think of things I would know for sure. 
are we want to be Michigan focused. So if some piece of your work has something to do with another state um, that's not like a learning exchange or something, we wouldn't resource that. Um, I mean, if, I think this goes without saying, but it needs to be focused on this population. Um, so, and so, yeah. And, oh yeah, Veronica, your other two questions and then we'll pop it to the two that um, are in the chat. Yes, thanks. Um, that was helpful, Ashley. Can an organization apply for both grants? Yes. Sorry, oh, what was it? Can the organization apply for both grants? So an implementation grant as well as a planning grant oh, is what you mean? Oh, that's a key question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you can. And then more logistics. Is there a- Well, I, I have a question about that. Would it be a direct, would it be for the same project or an implementation grant for one project and a planning grant for another project? Yes, wouldn't be for the same thing. Okay. And then just a quick logistics, is there a budget template or on the website, I'm assuming it's just, uh, do we upload something or do we enter? Just The Flux system has a, um, it's like an Excel that you have to download. And so there are specific uh, buckets um, and then you enter the specific amount within each category. So again, one of the reasons we, we uh, suggest kind of looking in is to kind of see what that looks like. Okay. Actually, I'm going to assume that you ask if for if you apply for both grants that you don't want someone to apply for the same thing for both grants. That's what I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I mean, because the, yeah. the intention behind the planning grant is yeah. um, right a new a new concept, a new idea, um, and so that that's that's why. So I do see that there is a more technical question on um, the Flux system. The Flux portal has a screening question that asks if your organization else is outside the seven county area and suggests that we have a call with uh, the foundation. Should we still do this even though this RFP doesn't limit geographic location? So the question is, should we still have a call with the, the foundation? No, you would not need to. And mm -hmm. that I think we we'll, yeah, I was just going to say again, the last question was does formally does formally incarcerated include parolees, probationers, all justice involved? Yeah, so when we say um, formally incarcerated, yes, and those that have been incarcerated in um, a county jail or a state prison. Um, and then there is a question, can we get a copy of this recording? Yes, so we will send uh, both the recording and a uh, PDF of the slides um, out after this uh, so that you can share it with other folks. Is that to me? No, I that was that was to to us. I think yeah. Somebody uh -oh. you'll see it from the um, uh, Council of Foundations for Southeastern Mission will send out a kind of follow up email um, to this RFP webinar that will include both the recording and um, the slides. Oh, great question, Malia. What if they came from federal prison but are still under supervision in Michigan? Yep, so this is focused on Michigan residents, if they're a Michigan resident, yes. I see, Adam, that you have a hand up, Sue. Yeah, rather than trying to type this in, um, part, of our, part of our model is, is making sure that the people that we're hiring are, are uh, making a livable wage, are insured so that they can take care of some of the health inequities that have taken place over the course of their life. But we're not trying to do it as a lot of companies are trying to do where they're trying to retain them. We're trying to use it as an opportunity to advance them in their career because the best way to find a job is when you have a job and when you've been able to train and have a recent work history. So if it is in conjunction with something that we are already doing or another position that we would like to create, would this grant fall into that category? I think it does, but I didn't want to assume. 
Shoki, I, I think I can take this that I think it would fall into the grant category of scaling an existing project or or it could even fall into the category of uh, filling a persistent gap within a uh, within an existing program. But yes, I certainly think that that would fall into one of those two categories of the implementation grants. All right. Thank you. And then I see Shelly has asked uh, another technical question about uh, the Flux portal, saying that there, Shelly is not seeing the template to upload this grant to answer the questions. And then it looks like Boz, thank you so much, um, said that if you hit special opportunities, you'll, you should see it. Great. Is the grant limited to, Leticia asks, is the grant limited to incarcerated adults only looking to apply for, for age groups 17 to 26 arrested, some maybe not incarcerated in prison, but jailed? I'm deferring to you, Chioki, or you, Ashley, on that is I am not sure immediately the answer. I would say the grant includes that population. Um, I will note though, like there are some amazing groups who are doing work with young people, but who aren't like there's different issues, but not particularly specific to like reentry, incarceration, probation, parole. So like we do want to draw the distinction that it would need to be justice involved or justice impacted young people that are a part of the population being served. Thank you, Ashley. Any other questions? Also, I appreciate everyone navigating Flux. We know that system is like, it reminds me of like an IBM computer in like 1980. So I get it. It's like a challenging system to use, um, but it's what we're using. So thank you very much for engaging with it. With it. Great. I'll leave a couple more seconds. Yeah, so if we have questions after this, who do they go to? Ashley? Because I see her email on the RFP. Yeah, it would be Ashley and then either Ashley would respond or, or myself or Alex would. I think that would be um, the best way to do it. Ashley, we might be able to update that too. Um, perhaps to have Alex Rye's email address. Yeah, and I'll, I'll definitely forward questions. Like yeah. <laughs> but I think one thing that I do want to underscore is, um, again, coming from somebody who has, you know, done the workforce RFP responses, this is a real opportunity to do something that you have not had funds to do before. Um, because it is, it's open. Michigan Justice Fund is really seeking innovation and the ideas that you've always wanted to um, implement or add to an existing program, but might not have had the funds to do, um, because this is really to seed um, and advance the tremendous work that all organizations kind of here and on the ground across the, the state have been doing um, and to get more sustainable long-term uh, funding um, to be able to do. So be creative, uh, get all the folks involved who might be able to um, help support um, thinking about what this could look like. Uh, and we're really excited and um, grateful that all of you are here today um, and that you'll share the opportunity. Um, and know that, you know, share with everybody, right, who you know are in this space. Just because you have an amazing great opportunity doesn't mean that another person um, who has an equally great opportunity um, won't all get the funds, right? So. Thank you all for being here. Perfect. Well, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thanks so uh, much, everyone. Thank you.